Okay, we're going to get started with our presentation today. And um, this is the first of a series of six uh, presentations that we're doing over the winter. And um, the next one is on Judith Marvin's lecture on November 5th, and it's going to be on wood and stone architecture. And it will be at 2 o'clock, the same as this. And we will be sending out emails about it. So hopefully all of you can mark your calendar and come to that. And um, Jeff Olson, the smiling guy over here, is doing his presentation today on cinema. And one of the things he's been um, really involved and enjoys cinema. And he says, as a lover of cinema and the escape it provides, it's always great to have a conversation in an open forum. So I want to introduce Jeff. I could probably just head down to the grocery store and bump into any of you and you would recognize me and go, wait a minute, I know, we all know each other, right? So. I want to thank the friendly people for inviting me to get to do this and, and get to meet everybody and talk about it. And we're at a time always in life that we have to continue conversations no matter what they're about and keep those things going. So I always like to start everything with saying, welcome friends, welcome neighbors, and welcome new friends of people that I didn't know 20 minutes ago that I'm now friends with. So I think we need to make an effort every day to try to meet people that we don't know and get to know them and where they're from and what their background is and move on that way together. because. We have a great community with all three of these counties lined up together. You can kind of go anywhere in these places. And we're all, we all have a background, and we're all usually from somewhere else. And it's always interesting to find out why we got where we are. So it's nice to get to see all these smiling people out here. In these times of technology, I, I can't believe how fast things move right now. When I started school, uh, in high school, I was an usher in a movie theater, cleaning up seats at the end of the night and sweeping popcorn and looking at the screen and going, why does it look soft over there and out of focus? Or why is there a hair on the top of the screen that doesn't make sense? Or why is there a rattle in that speaker over there and this seat's broken over here? So it's just amazing to think about how fast everything moves. So we have steam engine and rail and iron and steel, and all of a sudden we're on the moon, and now today everybody's got a computer in their pocket. So when I started school, and I went to film school and I started running projectors going through school. They said digital projection is 100 years away. <laughs> and then, <laughs> right? <laughs> then by the time I finished my schooling, four, you know, four years later at San Jose State, they said digital projection's 50 years away. And I had been projecting already for 10 years at that point. I come up here to open up Angel Theater in 99 and they said, it's probably 25 years away. And a year later, they said, hey, do you want to go down and look at the new digital projectors we're going to install next year? <laughs> so I guess that cycle to me is that time moves really fast and yet kind of slow simultaneously. There's a lot of nice things that we can do that, that just pave the way. And it's kind of OK to have patterns and rituals and schedules and just do that. So I think it's important to, to just recognize that we're all here together. Thomas Edison invented the kinetoscope in 1891. That's kind of the start of it. Um, that predates film projection. So if you ever look and see in anywhere, they'll show a candlelight or a small carbon stick projecting a fixed image on a screen. Generally, that was a glass slide that was hand painted. And so they would call that going the, uh, a projection. And you would have a, a box with, hi, guys, come on in. Yay. Um, you'd have a box that's pre-built, and you'd have all these glass slides in, in a row. And then you would go in a tent and put in your nickel, and it would say, today we're going to go to Ireland, or today, tomorrow we're going to go to Yosemite, and all these places around the world. And they'd put a slide in, and they'd show it on the screen, and take it out, and put another glass in, and put it back in the box. And they, these guys would have a wagon full of all these glass slides. And that was predating film projection as far back as 1891. So some of the things that they used early on um, circular device with slits that are built into it, much like a card in a bike spoke when you spin it. And it had all these small little slits in it and a light in the middle, and they'd place all these pictures in it and spin it. And it would spin, and you look through the slit, and then you could see the movement. And that was the earliest 
technology that we had that got close to using everything as a moving picture, right? It's not really a moving picture. But it's fast enough that our naked eye can't discern that it's not actually fluid and moving all the way. Um, when they first got built and Edison first did it, he didn't patent it because, uh, hi Chuck, he didn't think it was, they thought it was a toy. They didn't think anybody would do anything with that. So the French came along and they developed a much better version of that and that's currently what everybody knows is a zoetrope. And that was patented. So then they were able to use the zoetrope and go into tiny little penny arcades and people could a penny in and flip and see the pictures. And that's another version before we had actual film projection. So Emile Rayon, he made what was called the theater optique. And that was the first time anybody used what we would call successive screens on a, successive frames on a screen. So regular film projectors are 24 frames per second. Even the ones that we're playing in movies now, if you watched a movie theater and it was film, it's 24 frames per second. So we figured out in technology base that if something blinked 24 times in one second, it was just fast enough that your brain couldn't see the in-between spots of the not blinking. And that was the standard. I mean, before that we had 16 millimeter, right? If you ever look at a 16 millimeter and eight millimeter film, you, you, it looks choppy and you can see it like it's doing this. It's because your brain can see the in-between spots in the frames. So 24 frames per second became the industry standard. And then we figured out how much film you could fit on a reel and how many reels it would take to play a movie in a theater. And then the opposite of that is that they took a carbon stick, right? So I actually projected Carbon Arc uh, in the early 80s because I wanted to learn how to use every kind of projection equipment possible to play a movie in a movie theater the right way. So of course in Chicago with the mafia and they have you know, the, the cards and the alcohol and the liquor, they decided they were gonna buy all the carbon sticks in the United States and have to buy them to, for movie theaters to Warner Brothers and pay double the money for it or else nobody could watch a movie. We're just trying to make a, a bright light and throw some light on the wall and watch a movie. So the carbon arc stick worked good because it would burn about 22 minutes per stick of light and a movie reel would be 20 minutes. So if your projectionist isn't paying attention and he lights that light too early, you're gonna miss the last minute of that reel. You know, so it's all technology based of how many machines we could make work at the same time at the right place to play that movie for the public. So Thomas Edison created the phonograph in 1885. Lee DeForest is known in 1919 to having created a patent for sound film. He didn't have a talking picture, technically, because he, didn't, he wasn't able to figure out a way to get the synchronous sound connected to the film itself when it played in a projector. But he figured out how to get a movie on film and play it in a projector, and then record it on a wax cylinder, and he figured out how to mic that up so that you could hear one sound playing while you're watching another thing at the same time. So that way they would sync together. They were synchronous to each other, but they weren't on the same piece of data, the same material. People had a hard time with it. First people in the turn of the century in movie theaters, when the train was pulling into the station, they thought they were gonna get run over by the train. And everybody got out of their chair and ran out the other way to get out of the building because they didn't know. And they thought that the train was coming through the screen. We'd never seen it. I mean, it's a, but everyone's got a phone in their pocket, right? And when you first get that technology, you go, how does this even work? Now I get to see my dad and every time he walks in the door, he says, hey, what's the password for the Wi-Fi? I need to do some stuff. I said, it's good to see you too, dad. I just wanted to say hi, right? It's all right. So we know that in 1927, globally, we had sound technology for movies. We know we had silent pictures far before that, right? 1919, 1920, 1921 is when theaters really started operating and playing film, silent film. We like to think over here that we helped invent sound technology for, for movie theaters, but Italy and France beat us to it and they did it in 1927. But once everybody knows the technology in the world, everybody else kind of jumps right on that bandwagon. So June, July of 1927 was the jazz singer, Al Jolson, first sound movie ever to play in theaters. Nobody thought it would matter. Everybody thought it was trivial. They thought it was just an escape that nobody was gonna take onto it for it. Warner Brothers, same Warner Brothers we have now, said, I think this is gonna work. They took their own money, their own resources, and found a theaters back east, theaters in the Midwest, and theaters in California, they thought were gonna be pivotal stopping spots to see a movie in, 
and they went into those theaters, no cost to the theater operators, and put in sound systems, speakers and wires. Clearly it worked. But of course that was mono sound, one speaker, single track. All the sound of the whole movie comes through one speaker. So in the, after World War II, a really amazing company of RCA came along and they invented a really, really big, heavy magnet speaker to drive that sound in the theater. And it was called the voice of the theater. Great big box, bigger than me, huge box. They're amazing, they're wonderful. We make things that last forever. Of course, now you buy a microwave and two years later you gotta buy another microwave because everything has planned obsolescence and it breaks on purpose. Side note, when I came up in 99 to reopen Angel Theater, first thing I did was climb behind the screen and look and see if there's a voice of the theater speaker back there. And of course there was. And in what every theater I've ever built, San Jose, Pleasanton, Dublin, and all the other places I've helped out build theaters at, you take that voice of the theater speaker in the back of that screen and you can connect that to just your dialogue channel for your movie. Because now we have 5.1 sound, right? Five to one, what's the one? One is us, one to five. So we have left channel, center channel, right channel, surrounds, and then us, that's the, okay? All the different channels you have for the numbers of how, spe how speakers work. We didn't have surround sound back then when the movies were playing. We didn't even have stereo sound back then when movies were playing. It was just mono, one. But it was still talking and noise through a film. So when you wire a voice of the theater speaker to center channel, now I can go buy any other type of brand of speakers I want for the surrounds and all the other crazy noises that are going on in the background. But that speaker that's back there right now is from like 1942 patent on it, and it still works. And, and it has the cleanest, clearest, beautiful dialogue ever. So sometimes people say, you gotta go in these old theaters and look for this first because it's worth the most money. And I go. But everything moves, it, it's amazing how fast it goes. So movies are playing, people are going to movies indoors. We go into World War II. Economy changes, money changes. We get back from World War II, GI Bill, get to work, buy a house, start a family, buy a car. Everybody went driving a car. Theater owners went, oh crap, everybody's driving around on the weekends, they're not going to the movies. Let's build drive-in movie theaters. That way they get to drive, and we still get their dollar when they go see a movie at the end of the night. And all of you probably remember growing up with your families and maybe your parents, of you know, getting a picnic basket and going to the drive-in, and, and it's an amazing memory. To, I mean, I can still remember watching the original Star Wars and Herbie the Love Bug as a double feature at the drive-in in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, <laughs> because mom made potato salad and chicken, and we got to go to the movies. <laughs> you know, you can all remember, right, Judge? What's, you remember kissing her in the theater one of the first times? Occasionally. Yeah, occasionally, right? <laughs> so then Dieter said, wait a minute, Everybody's going to the drive-in. We gotta invent stereo sound. Can't do stereo outside at a drive-in because all the sound will just float up in the air and it won't be able to even hear that stereo. So then they got left, center, and right and made movies that were, you know, stereo-based rock music and all this other stuff. Everybody got left the drive-ins and went back. But then speakers for car radios got a lot better. And they said, wait, we could make it so they could tune into the channel at the drive-in on their car stereo, so that amazing car system that they built, now they can play the movie sound through their car. Let's get back again. And it's just a complete revolving door. It just keeps going. We're constantly changing technology to try to meet people's needs. Hopefully it has a lot to do with just telling the story again. We had color TVs before we had black and white TVs. But we didn't want to sell color TVs yet because black and white was such a new thing. Everybody was going to buy a black and white TV. Ten years later, we could say, color. It was already in there. So then in marketing, everybody does it. We run film at the theater, any theater. Now everything goes to digital projection. Pros and cons. It's still a big machine and has a lot of moving parts and things could break. But there's no film degradation. There's no scratches. There's no lines on it. So it does have a nice, crisp, clear image. We have 1080p clarity of the screen, I'm just gonna say, 1080p for quality. But what did they do when we built the new projectors at the theater? They gave us 720 projectors. So that five years later, we'd have to upgrade and buy a 1080 projector. I said, it's already right there. Why can't we just change the dial? 
I just want to play a movie. Because of technology. Lifestyles change, people's needs and wants change. But a lot of things just stay consistent, right? You want to go see an amazing film or go see a great movie, read a good book. That stays the same. You have seats in theaters that rumble. It's called D-Box. You have Atmos sound where the speakers push air towards you and you could feel that, right? At what point is a movie the story of the, the film or a carnival ride? Like, 3D is pretty cool, but not everything needs to be 3D. You know, 3D was fun. Like, people all liked Avatar in 3D. But, you know, we don't need sense and sensibility in 3D, right? The story tells it. The story is itself. We don't need it. And so I think at times with every technology, we need to stop and back up and say, what is it that we're trying to do here? What are we trying to learn from this? Or, or what is this escapism that we're trying to do? So carbon arc was huge. We went over from carbon arc to xenon lamps and projectors. And now we go into the digital technology. And, and I think to myself, what's next? China and Korea are developing a screen that's an LCD screen, LED screen that's a big white sheet. And it's got a big bunch of cables in the back to do it this way. And you just take it and you just roll it all up in a big ball. And it just they ship it to you. And you just unroll it and put it on the screen, on the wall. And I go. So I, I, again, at what point, until we have a consistent technology, at what point do we jump ship and go with that technology, right? Right now, I think we're just going to keep throwing light on a white wall and keep playing it, you know? I think part of that, to me, is that aside from all the mechanics of how you're watching what you're watching or how it works, the magic is still the story. People know that magic. So everybody can think of something that they think is amazing, right? Vertigo, Wizard of Oz, you know, anything with Jimmy Stewart, right? I mean, like everybody's got things they really like, you know? Like Cuckoo's Nest, right? Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? I wrote down this morning Maltese Falcon, Chinatown, Blade Runner, Memento, Shawshank Redemption, 12 Angry Men, Gone with the Wind, Oppenheimer? Is Oppenheimer on the list now? I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, you should try. So there's, there's definitely movies that people watch every year. Maybe at Christmas time you watch Wonderful Life or whatever you watch that's your go-to feel-good happy thing or that book you read or that chapter. Uh, I, you know, arguably, like, is Oppenheimer going to be the next Citizen Kane? It's hard to say. My dad liked it, sent me about 40 emails the next morning with <laughs> the clothes in Oppenheimer, the shoes in Oppenheimer. The he was very excited about it. He's <laughs> which is a good thing. We worry about how fast we get things done in life, and we worry about, you know, am I making enough money? Am I going to get the car paid off? Am I going to get the house paid off? And all those other things. Orson Welles was 25 when he made Citizen Kane. He wrote it when he was 23. At the time, in late 1924, he was working in radio. And the studio said, we're going to let you make Citizen Kane. He didn't say no. So he, all day, he would shoot Citizen Kane all day. And then it was an hour car ride to the radio station where he was doing the overnight radio programs. So we had a driver, and his dinner would be ready. And he'd eat in the car ride and go drive an hour and do, be on the radio all night, sleep for an hour, and go back the next day and make Citizen Kane because he didn't want to miss the chance to do it. 25 years old. Sidney, Lum Sidney Lumet was 33 years old when he did 12 Angry Men. It's pretty young. Greta Gerwig was 34 years old. Who's Greta Gerwig, right? She's our Barbie girl right now, this year, Barbie. But she did uh, Lady Bird. That's the big movie that took place in Sacramento. She was 34. Maddie Rich is a kid that grew up in Chicago in, so in, in a really rough inner city urban area. And he got involved in an after school program with somebody to try to teach people how to write better because he wasn't very good at reading or writing. At 15, he was watching any movie he could get his hands on, and he wrote a script called Straight Out of Brooklyn. And at 17, he borrowed $20,000 off his uncle's credit card and made a movie. 
that I played in a theater when I was working in San Jose in 1987 called Straight Out of Brooklyn. So it, it, we have movies that are very inexpensive and movies that are crazy money. And, and just because something has a lot of money or a big budget doesn't, I don't know that it makes it any better or any worse. We've all seen movies that are just tiny little movies and they're, they're wonderful. But money is a funny thing. Athletes, $17 billion to play two seasons as a catcher for baseball? That seems like a lot of money. <laughs> Tom Cruise, $28 million to be in a... And then they say, it's a flop at the box office. Well, it has to make four hundred. has to make a billion dollars to break even. Something is askew here. Something is wrong. Scale wages for a Hollywood actor or actress right now forever is $32,000. And then anything you can negotiate in a contract above that is what you get paid. So when Zemeckis decided he was tired of making bigger Hollywood movies and he was going to make Forrest Gump, he decided it was just a little poem, a little fantasy that he wanted to make, Forrest Gump. Nobody took him seriously. He financed it himself. It finally got distributed in theaters, but nobody thought anybody was going to care about it. Nobody thought anybody was going to want to watch it. So Tom Hanks said, I'm ready for a break, and I'm ready for something new. I'll do it for scale and 5% of the back end. And they said, well, there won't be a back end, so we'll have no problem letting you do Forrest Gump for 5% of the back end. Run, Forrest, run. Now what happened, right? So then when Band of Brothers came out, and everybody was watching Band of Brothers 20 years ago, he, he co-financed and paid and produced for half of the cost for all of Band of Brothers to get made and shot and produced on location. They said, Tom, you've had a great career and you've made a lot of money. How could you possibly do that? Run, Forrest, run. Took all that money and he put it all, you know. He'll pay it forward. He makes money and he pays it forward. But, but so there's movies where they think they're going to make tons of money and they don't. And then there's a guess that they say, will that ever be good or not? I saw Shawshank Redemption in the theater the weekend it came out. And I was the only one in the theater. Two weeks later, they're packed and you couldn't get a ticket to see it for word of mouth. But we didn't have the computers the way we did back then, right? We didn't have Yelp and Google and and everything else, and you could just trash anybody, oh, it was horrible, or you know, whatever, or it's amazing, and how, again, that's that technology of how fast things go, and how fast the words are. When film first came out, and it played in theaters, 35 millimeter film, it's celluloid film on a reel that gets sent to you. Whatever type of projection system you have to project it can vary. And the first theater I ran in college as a projectionist was an art and foreign film theater. Everything's on film, so you've got to splice it all together and build up every movie every week or two, play it, break it all back down and ship it back out. Well, we were playing French and German films and Italian films and small American independent films, like truly independent, but we didn't have a contract with Asia yet to play Chinese films. And I wanted to play John Woo's movie, The Killer. I wanted the John Woo film in 1989. I couldn't get it. So I stayed up all night and I called over there to Toho Studio, and I got an interpreter on the phone, and I said, figure out a way to get me this movie. And he said, what do you propose? And I said, get the Yokohama boat that brings all the cars down, all the way through Columbia River up in Oregon and down into Oakland, stuff the film reels in a barrel with hay, and tar it up, and put a bill of lading on it, and then put a Greyhound bus bill of lading from Oakland to San Jose on it, and I'll just write a check when it gets here. I was 20. And everybody's like, oh, you're playing this movie and the David Cronenberg and all these crazy movies, Jeff. When are you going to play the John Woo movie? And I said, when the boat gets here. And they go, but really? And I said, but really? Because the tides, we don't know how long it's going to take the 28 to 31 days about how long it takes to get the boat here. I got, and I checked it and I got noticed that my Greyhound bill was live. It got all the way here. And I got my little hand truck out that I still have to this day. And I walked eight blocks down the road to the Greyhound and got my, zip, my bungee cord out and I put that barrel on it. I must have looked like some crazy kid with long hair and a big long beard and I'm running down the street with a barrel on my wagon, right? I get back to the theater. I gotta haul this barrel upstairs to the projection room. And my boss goes, why is there hay all over the projection room floor? Because I'm playing the John Woo movie. Oh, well that's okay then. Six months later they signed a contract to distribute 
international Asian film into the U.S. And so then it just got, got mailed and then <laughs> DHL or FedEx would drop it off. But it's true. If you have something you want to get it done, there are ways to make it get done. Angel Cedar was closed for 20 years. We got it going. Angel Cedar <laughs> wasn't my penny. It's just a little bit of this and a whole lot of that, right? Angel Cedar was built in 1924. Sound technology was 1927. So for three years, Angel Cedar was a silent film theater. So all the color is different. Silent film, black and white, not color film. All the makeup is different. All the lighting is different. All the cue cards are different. Silent film. You had people that made a ton of money working on small movies. I mean, back then, a ton of money. But getting paid to be in silent films. They thought sound technology was going to be trivial and nobody would take it seriously. But clearly, Warner Brothers didn't think so. Warner Brothers was right. They started making sound films, sync sound film, right? You got people that people adored on screen and watching these <laughs> La Boheme and all these other amazing silent little pictures. All of a sudden, they put a mic on them. And they go, ah! They go, oh, God, you sound horrible. You're fired. <laughs> so Hollywood flipped over about 90% of their, their talent overnight to find people that could actually talk well, sound good, and sing, and sing well on a screen. It's a huge change. If you ever watch like an old Western or any old movies that's silent and you got you know the horse galloping down the road and the piano music going and everything great going and you'll see there'll be a card they put up to read like like an old vampire film or anything the card and you read it and you go okay and then it'll go on and another card and you go okay why is it taking so long normally it got paced that way in the 20s and 30s and 40s and even in the late you know for people to read because most people education-wise didn't know how to read and they would have enough time for their kids to read the card into their parents' ear and whisper it to their parents in the movie so they would know what was going on. The, the pacing is very deliberate and on purpose because a lot of people couldn't read, but they could still watch the movie and try to piece it together and figure it out. Hmm, we've come a long way. This year was my 38th year in movie theaters. How can that be? <laughs> I've been lucky to make a lot of good friends and be in a great community and get to, to play movies and see people smile. I had kids that didn't like to read and their parents got them Harry Potter and they started reading and then because of that they started reading other books, not just Harry Potter, and it helped them get reading in them as kids. Parents come to the theater and they got seven, eight, nine year olds watching Harry Potter. Fast forward 23 years later, those kids have kids, and I redid Harry Potter at the theater, and now they're bringing their kids to the theater to see Harry Potter, and I'm still there. And they go, remember me? And I go, of course I do. <laughs> yep. I would say that we should stop and slow down, work together, go down that hiking trail that you've never hiked before, stop at that restaurant, that you've never eaten at but always thought about. Read that book that your neighbor lent you that you didn't think you were going to like. Or hopefully, watch a movie you didn't think you had any interest in and find out you really love it. So I appreciate all you guys for being here today. If anybody has anything they want to talk about or questions, hi there. My sister worked with me in the theater the day it burned. Your sister was in the theater the day it burned. That would have been like June of 1957. Is that right? Somewhere in there. 56? We don't want to, she might have cheated on her application to get a job there. I have to remember, I have to remember what they were playing there at the time because I talked to Dan Darby's wife, Eleanor, Eleanor and she, That's her sister. right. <laughs> so she told me there was, they were playing a movie there that had to do with fire. Like it was like something like, you know, the Atticus on fire. There was a movie about a building catching on fire. And at first she told me that people didn't know it was really on fire. And somebody was, Eleanor told me, she was, they were walking up and they put their nickel down and they said, fire, get out. And she went to grab it and pull it in anyway, but the person took it back and said, I'm not coming in. You can't have my nickel. Well, my dad was a home leader on the hill above, but mm -hmm. she, mm -hmm. she, she ran down there and made sure. She was okay. Yeah. But that's what's amazing about this community and about this area, in any area, really, 
is like, um, if you go in a lot of the shops, even the gift shop up here has got all the old pictures, the postcards of downtown Angels Camp. And there's one that's like late 50s, early 60s, somewhere in there. And you, you can see like the drugstore and the, 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 you know, the theaters, all these other pictures are in there. And on the side of the road where Sally Powers had Pickle Barrel was Dan Darby in his car. And it's on all the postcards. And one day I opened this up and I said, is that you? And he looked and he goes, yeah, that's me, right? He said, I didn't get any pennies for being in that thing either. I got nothing. In the 70s, both of Tumor Kid worked at the theater. Yeah. Brian and Denise Darby both worked in the theater. In the right. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. Um, I mean, it's a family. I helped a lot of kids there. I came in in 99 and 2000, and I hired a lot of people they thought were going to be troubled youth or hard to work with kids. Oh, you don't want to hire them. And I'm like, everybody's got a chance, right? When I first came to do the theater, a year later, I started teaching film history at Columbia College. I don't know if anybody was in that class or not. But that was a really popular class over at Columbia for film history over there. And I did it back and forth. But you could see kids that, like, everyone's wired differently. Some are very tactile. Some need to, you know, touch it to know how to make popcorn. Some need to write it down and make a note. Some, you know, and all those different ways that people learn and that we can educate. But I, I've had, I've, how many, couple hundred people work for me at the theater, kids work for me at the theater, and whatever they're going through at home. And you can help them get through a process, right? I mean, I had a kid that was there that just, you know, his parents didn't, you know, he just had no self-esteem and it, whatever. And within time, his, his chin got a little higher and he's like, wait, I'm making a difference, I'm helping, right? I gave this kid a 50 cent raise. And you'd have thought I gave him gold bars, man, because he said, but, but the point is that somebody recognized his efforts. And so that's, that's part of this community. Again, read a book you haven't read, meet someone you don't know anything about. See, you guys all know each other, right? <laughs> But it's amazing, right? You can meet people that you've never met before and eat food you haven't eaten before. And, and you know, it's a big, again, this is that timeline, right? Steam engine, railroad, we're on the moon, computer in your pocket. I mean, at what point do we kind of maybe flip back over? Time goes so fast. Just take a minute. Loma Prieta came. I was in San Jose at the time, getting on an elevator in the dorms. And then everything started shaking and I went, Nope! And we got back off the elevator and the door shut and there was two people that were in there, I'm going downstairs quicker than you are. Yeah, they were trapped in that elevator for eight hours after that, right? <laughs> so like, I live in a super funky little area in San Jose downtown and I've got like a Filipino family on this side and a Mexican family on this side and a black family behind me and an Asian family in front of me. And everybody's like, you know, before you even stared at your phone all day, <laughs> no one was talking to anybody very much. Loma Prieta comes and I'm knocking on everybody's door. And I'm like, I've got some carne asada, and I've got some ice. And this guy says, well, I've got some rice and some vegetables, and well, I've got some charcoal briquettes. And if you've all ever traveled anywhere, and you go to a place or a culture that you don't know anything about, as soon as you break bread with somebody, you're friends. It's a commonality. Movies can be the same way, a commonality, right? Somebody goes, well, I'm from Mexico. Well, let's put a Mexican film in. Wait, what? You know, how did you know this movie? It's fun stuff. Let's be friends. There were talks about it. Um, hopefully, yeah. What's that? They're, they're aware of the 100 year coming, and I've told the right people that it's coming. Um, it's all, you know, as theaters get bigger and bigger all the time, and as, as uh, they think that every second of time on a screen is money in their pocket. And I am not that way. My thought is, let's do functions and things that are important and donate time to highlight these movies. So I hope that they listen, and I hope that they um, will, will, I mean, think about it, it's 100 years. Maybe they'll have me talk there for 100 years. <laughs> Go ahead, young lady. The speaker from 1942 that's in the theater. Yes. No, it's plugged into the sound system, and they use it every day. It's in the big main, it's in the big room, the front room with the the minor murals on it. We're hearing that. Oh yeah, too. yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. So it's very used, right. but in the same place. <laughs> I would say that it 
So we know if the building was built in 1924 and sound technology was 1927, they obviously had some kind of a different speaker in there from 27 to 42, like 15 years, right? That, you know, but that's been sitting there since then. Yeah, yeah, I was super happy to see it. I mean, that's kind of nerdy, right? <laughs> but, but it's pretty neat, right? You know what nerd stands for? Never ending rad dude. <laughs> Judge, that was okay. Seventy millimeter? What? It's very so instead of just sitting and watching and listening or reading to your movie, we now can interact with your movie. Oh, and right. Feel it. Uh, the yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, it's it's. It's not really historical because it's not. We've chopped it up a lot of times. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's a huge, I, it's hard technology wise, right? I don't know um, because it's such an event. I know you're talking about the capsules, you know, when you watch it and it's the whole, the whole experience. Or the whole jet. Yeah. I mean, everything's rattling and shaking. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah. Feel the water. I mean, they've done it in places and it's worked, but then it, and then, and then it just fades away really quickly. So it's hard, it's hard to put that technology in that installation and then take it back out. Yep, right? So we know that seventh grade level, right, that we have about 12 seconds to hook somebody on something or else their brain goes and they've lost it. So when you, you ever go down to sit down and watch a movie, and like 20 minutes in, you're like, start. Well, the book's the same way, though. You get two chapters in and go, I don't even know what this is about yet. <laughs> so I don't know. That's a tricky, I hope so. I mean, will this theater ever do that? Yeah, it's it's crazy awesome. Yeah. Mhm. Mm it's it's like uh, yeah. Um, what is the when you ha when you have the headsets on, like like VR and there's a it's a combination of like a lot of technologies. Yeah. So. Right, so everybody has a different escape, right? So when we were all growing up and going to movies, right, cups didn't even have arm, uh, didn't have cup holders for your soda. Didn't. How did we make it? We drank out of the garden hose and everything. But you knew, well, you knew coming up when you were at the movies and you had to go to the restroom, you could walk down the aisle and not kick over somebody's soda in the dark. That's part of that technology I was talking about earlier with like cars had drive-ins, right? And then theaters invented stereo sound. And then the drive-in said, well, let's pump it through the car speakers, right? And then you have cups that are, you know, arm hold arms that have cup holders for your soda. And then now we have trays that you can put your popcorn and nachos on. And, and, and like at what point do we just get to go and watch, you know, Jimmy Stewart or, and then it's all the loungers. Can anybody stay awake when they watch a movie with the lounge chairs? I, I can't, I can't lounge. He was just sitting in there sleeping. Yeah. It wasn't me. <laughs> but, but not by much, huh? Yeah. Hello. Unfortunately, no. The reason is because everything is distributed differently. When we hit this perfect time between 99 and 2006, when there was still small little independent distributing companies that would distribute independent film. And as that got popular, the big main seven, the big studios like Fox, Warner Brothers, Disney and all those, they all watched that happen and went, hey, we, we need an independent film division, right? And so they just kind of enveloped all that into one. So there's still small films that get made in independent-ish 
films like Lady Bird by Greta Gerwig was independent and small, but there is no distribution of that anymore. And the, so when independent film and small little foreign films played well at the Angels Theater, there was only two contracts. There was a theater contract and then a VCR contract when it played it like eight months or a year later, two. But soon after that 2005, 2006 time, we have DVD, Blu-ray, streaming, and everything else. And so now, unfortunately, the big machines that make all the money mucked up all the gears. And now when a theater plays in a theater, it's actually the least important venue they want to play a movie in. They're ready for it to be at home immediately. They don't even care. Legally, due to monopoly laws, it has to play in a theater to have a home run. Uh, unless now, now they'll make them directly to be at home only. Um, so the tricky part was then they'd say, you're going to play it in a theater. Because back then, I could play a tiny little movie in a theater and say, you're going to get 80, 20 terms on it, and you're going to get paid for it. And I don't even care about videotape. And so you could afford to play a small little movie. But then they changed it and said, um, it's going to play in theaters, but you're only going to get this tiny piece because we're ready for it not to play in theaters because it's going to play on VCR and DVD and Blu-ray and streaming. And now, how many streaming platforms are there? I don't even know. Too many. A lot. So now you could have a banger, super great movie coming out in theaters. And 29 days later, it's for at home already. It's a pretty short window. When we were kids and went to the movies, I remember I'd get out of the theater rubbing my eyes because it's bright outside and I'd say to my parents, I can't wait for a year to go by so I can watch Raiders of the Lost Ark at home on videotape, right? Because it was a year and now, or it'll even be the same day and date. It'll play in a theater and you can buy it or rent it for five bucks on Paramount the same day. That's just where the industry has shifted. The cereals. Yeah. Cereals were huge after World War II, and, and they really were really popular through all the 50s and made it to the early 60s. And then distribution rights changed and terms changed of how much theaters got charged by the movie houses to get the movie house to get to play that film. And they realized that if they were going to play an A picture, a newsreel, a serial, and a cartoon, and then a B picture and the same stuff again, they realized instead of two shows a day, if they pulled all the other stuff out, they could fit in three shows a day that they could charge for each one. So it all boils down to pennies and dollars. Yep. What about cable? I mean, What's that? Oh, I pulled a whole bunch of kids at the theater together and told them all they got to get their act together, and then we were going to write a little script about a movie and shoot it and produce it, and I was going to show them how to edit and hold the camera and run the lights and everything. It's somewhere on a video, a mini tape on my desk, I'm sure, somewhere. It's just a little, it was an exercise. I know, yeah, it was an exercise to get kids motivated. Yeah. Anyway, it's a nice group. I'm really happy that the museum is here, and I'm really excited that we can keep moving forward and preserve this history of it. And you got to come in and, and at least be with each other and, and hear me for a little while. So it's great to see you guys, and I'm glad you're here.